Um, all right, so I'm going to give an update from the community council first. Um, the first thing that I wanted to talk about was our CIP application. So this year, uh, there were about two, two and a half to five million dollars worth of CIP applications submitted that would impact our neighborhood. At next month's meeting, we're going to go over all of those since tonight's meeting uh, is dedicated to our candidate forum. Uh, next month is when we'll go over the CIP applications. The community council submitted a few of them um, to start implementing the one Glendale plan that we created last year. Uh, just off the top of my head, the ones that are at the top of my head, this is not a comprehensive list, uh, but we submitted an application for a crosswalk north of the Glendale branch of the Salt Lake City Library. Basically, what we submitted to do is for that intersection at Concord and uh, California Avenue, and then the one at Glendale Drive and California Avenue, we'd like to redesign those intersections to be much more pedestrian friendly and then add, uh, as I mentioned, the uh, uh, crosswalk there to just make it safer for folks that are using the library. Uh, the other one that I can think of off the top of my head, we submitted in partnership with Heartland Communities for Youth and Family. Uh, that organization we submitted to redesign and improve the Peace Labyrinth Park uh, at about 15th and, and a half south and uh, the Jordan River. Another one was to add garbage cans at a couple of places along the nine line and throughout the neighborhood at all of the bus stops in the neighborhood. Uh, and then the last one that I can think of um, off the top of my head is to transform the little triangular piece of land at 800 West and California Avenue into a new little park, park that would kind of be a welcome to Glendale um, park and sign and that type of thing. So um, as I mentioned at our next meeting is when we'll, we'll go over those in depth. Um, and then also at our next meeting, uh, we're going to be going over some proposed bylaw changes that the board would like to suggest to uh, the community to make. Basically, uh, again, we'll do a deep dive of these at next month's meeting and then talk about them again in December, with our goal being approving those bylaw changes so that they'll be in effect uh, by the next time that we have elections. So the chair, vice chair, and second vice chair position are both up for election in January, and we hope to have the revised bylaws in place so that when the new leadership team comes in, uh, they have the opportunity to, to work with clean new bylaws. Um, none of them are really major changes, um, just formalizing some of the processes that we've been using, like electing new officers uh, and that type of thing. The other thing that I wanted to um, mention was next, next Wednesday, the 27th, will be the first meeting of our Friends of Glendale Parks Committee. Uh, so this is a, another way that we're, we're implementing the one Glendale plan that we created last year. Uh, and this will give us the opportunity um, to, uh, sorry, I completely just blanked. Uh, it, it, basically the Friends program will give us the opportunity to raise funding, and to uh, kind of support our parks in a number of different ways. So implementing projects, uh, cleaning up parks, uh, supporting uh, other... And uh, just supporting the parks in general. So at next week's meeting, uh, we'll be talking about starting the Friends of Glendale Parks uh, and get that process moving forward. Um, the last thing that I wanted to mention, uh, I. Previously mentioned that elections would be held in January. Uh, if you are interested, we'll have more information about this coming in the next little while. We're hoping to be back in person uh, for that election meeting. But if we're not back in person, um, we, we will have a plan for doing it electronically. So the board talked about it at our last meeting. Uh, we're kind of thinking about ways to do it. If you have ideas, uh, or ways that you'd like to see an electronic election conducted, let us know. Um, but otherwise, the board will come back with an answer uh, shortly um, before our November meeting. So the next thing, I want to just give folks who are on the call the opportunity to give updates. I saw that Ken from the Sorensen Center had joined. Uh, maybe we'll start with Ken. And if there's anyone else that would like to give 
updates, uh, community updates. Now is the time we're going to start our candidate forum right at 720. Thank you, Turner. Uh, hi, I'm Ken Perko with the Sorensen Community Campus on 9th West and California Avenue. Um, not a lot of updates aside from kind of what I've said over the months. Um, we're still focused on providing essential services. So the dental clinic, our technology center, the fitness center, and basketball and boxing gyms are still open, um, as are the youth programs and early Head Start. Um, we are uh, having, uh, we, we partner with the University of Utah Wellness Bus, and they're going to be doing a flu shot clinic this Saturday from 10 to 2 on the plaza just south of the Unity Center. So I would want to get the word out about that. Um, and they usually have uh, plenty of spots. So that's this Saturday, um, just south of the Unity Center. Um, you see you'd enter the parking lot from 900 West, um, and it's a free flu shot clinic from 10 to 2. Um, unfortunately, we're still having a hard time uh, getting lifeguards, and so the pool is still not open, but we're, we've got some things in the works, and so hopefully the pool will be reopening um, for lap swimming soon. Um, that's it for me, but always welcome any comments or questions. Thank you. Uh, any questions for Kim? All right. Uh, any other community updates? Um, I see that Sarah wanted to give an update um, on an event that she is organizing uh, at Three Creeks Confluence on Saturday, April 16th. It'll be art at the confluence. Um, so far, we've received funding through uh, the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Program and the Seven Canyons Trust. Um, and we'll be including Glendale artists um, like Catherine Mortimer and the Busking Bus. Um, We'll have additional information on this uh, when Sarah gets her voice back. Uh, but if you want to ask questions uh, or or have in, um, would like more information, you can message Sarah directly. Um, any other community updates? Turner, I'd love to give a couple. Yes. Hello, everyone. Um, let's see some city council updates. Um, mask mandate, of course, is extended in Salt Lake City schools for K through 12, um, at least until Christmas break. And then we're continuing to play it by ear. Had Angela Dunn, Dr. Dunn from the director of the county health department, formerly from the state health department, um, at our meeting yesterday to give us an update on how things are going statewide. Right now, it looks like um, in general in, the, in Salt Lake City, we're doing better than elsewheres. Um, however, 84104 is still one of the hardest hits um, with the lowest vaccination rate. So please, everyone, go get vaccinated. Um, let's see. We have upcoming uh, $58 million bond proposal, which does include a lot of investment for the West Side and um, Glendale in particular, um, including 10 million for the Glendale Water Park, 440,000 for the boat ramp right adjacent at 1700 South, another 3.4 million for West Side Parks. So lots of good stuff happening there. Um, the Glendale Water Park planning process, um, that public engagement process should begin next month. So stay tuned there um, and that will carry into the new year to figure out exactly what it is. There. Um, mm -hmm we the community need to um, have in that space. So um, look forward to hearing from everybody on that one. Let's see, and then that should do it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I saw that Daniel had an update uh, or community event to share as well. Yeah, um, hi everybody. I'm uh, part of a, a group called PICTAR, um, which is Pacific Island Knowledge to Action Resources. Um, Part of one of the chat, one of the programs that they do is called Kava Talks. Um, it's knowledge above uh, violence always. It's a domestic violence prevention um, group. Um, but they're having their annual um, Kava Talks dinner along with their Heels to Heal walk. Um, and that's going to be on the 29th and 30th of this month of October. Um, the, the dinner is, is I think somewhere in Midvale, but the walk is actually happening at the Peace Gardens. Um, and what happens is men will um, 
walk for approximately a mile-ish or something like that in heels um, as solidarity to sort of combat the, um, you know, the, the rampant domestic violence, especially that's prevalent in the Pacific Island community. Um, I'll drop the link in the, in the chat as well as send a flyer over to Turner to add uh, to the announcements. But just wanted to mention that that'll be on the 29th on the Friday night is the dinner and the 30th is going to be in the afternoon um, right there at the Peace Gardens. And it should be a, an event that'll also be having, um, you know, COVID immunizations and, and uh, you know, uh, a, a big event like that. So welcome to uh, join in whichever community you're in, whether or not you're in the Pacific Island community. It's a it's an issue we're all dealing with. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other uh, community updates? Every candidate that's participating has joined. Um, so if it's okay with you all, I'd say we go ahead and get started a few minutes early, um, if that's okay with everyone. Looks like everybody who's supposed to be here is here. All right, uh, why don't we go ahead and get started. The first candidate, so before the event, I'd like to give just a couple of uh, ground rules for what we're hoping to happen tonight. Uh, what we did is we gave each candidate 20 minutes tonight. Uh, we'll be keeping time, uh, but candidates were kind of invited to use that time however they liked. We suggested uh, maybe just kind of a little bit of a formal, not necessarily presentation, but just a little bit of information. Uh, and then the time is yours as a community. So if you have questions, if you have comments, uh, things like that, please feel free to jump in. If you wanna raise your hand, I can call on folks. Um, if things kind of get wild, I'll do that and we'll have folks raise their hands. Um, otherwise, each candidate has 20 minutes. We'd ask each campaign uh, to not respond to anything that anyone else is saying. Um, you will have your full 20 minutes and uh, we just want the time to be yours with the community. So uh, my role will be just kind of keeping time, keeping things going. Um, and then as we move forward, we'll go from there. The, the first candidate, is Ali, um, who we will have go first. Um, we did, when we put the order together, uh, we used a randomizer. So we put all five names into a randomizer and it gave us our order. So we didn't pick the order, it was done uh, randomly uh, with the exception of Daniel who was scheduled at the end um, be, uh, because we heard from him last, but we wanted to make sure that he was included in the event. So. With that, uh, Alejandro, if you want to go first. I mean, if you're asking me, probably not, but you know, the, the, uh, so hi everybody, I'm Alejandro. I'm running for city council, as you guys know by now. Uh, I'm running because I know that the city can do better. You're not going to hear from me excuses. Uh, you're not going to hear from me uh, just always trying to excuse the city. You know, you're gonna hear from me uh, some uh, some new energy uh, and my experience uh, in our community, in my community, and our community, and in the state of Utah speaks for itself. Uh, I I have done uh, quite a bit of work. Uh, you know, I, my company gathered the signatures for Bare Boundaries. Uh, you know, we actually pulled pulled that together to have a redistricting commission. It was us. A couple of years ago, we actually lobbied the legislature to increase the alcohol levels. Uh, for beer uh, from 3.2, that was us also. And we have done about 25 projects in the state of Utah, things that people thought it could not ever happen. Uh, and that is what I bring to the table. I don't bring to the table 30 years of experience in, in community organizing, but I do bring to the table energy and action. Uh, I am not the, an all face in the neighborhood. I'm a new, new guy. I am probably the new kid in the block. Uh, but I love this community as much as everybody else. You, um, I haven't, I didn't go to school here. I didn't go to high school or elementary school in this neighborhood, uh, but I share the same amount of love. And it doesn't mean that I don't love this community as much as you do. And uh, I think the fact that I chose to live here uh, is, is something very important. Many of us chose to live here uh, because we, we care about this area and we, we could afford this area, but no, not only that, I think uh, for me, it felt like home. Uh, it, it really was the only part of town that I really, really felt like home. 
Uh, I, I have, uh, for, for several years, I've been pushing the city and trying to get some accomplishments here. Uh, even not too long ago, asking uh, our council member for a light that, you know, for weeks and weeks, we, ask, we, we hear excuses for a light in the park. We heard, oh, it cannot be done. It cannot be done. We need to wait a year and a half for those to happen. And it was frustrating until us, the neighbors, forced the council member to actually say, oh, actually, we can do this. That to me is frustrating and our excuses. And the West Side, for 30 years, her excuses. And for 30 years, uh, it's a short term. It's, it's just a short time. I think for much longer than that. Uh, and that to me is, is frustrating. And when we, uh, we ask ourselves about vaccinations, and I heard this a little earlier today, vaccinations uh, and the lower number of vaccinations that unfortunately our community has, uh, and just saying, you know, please get vaccinated, is an example of no understanding this community. You know, this is a community uh, full of immigrants, full of like people from different backgrounds, people that are working two or three jobs, people that don't have the time sometimes to take off if they get sick, uh, if they're like, you know, getting some of the consequences from the vaccine, some of the uh, side effects. And they are scared, some of them, of those. You know, I am vaccinated, uh, fully vaccinated, and I'm always pushing some people to get vaccinated. But just saying those things are not a solution. We need to actually understand and be able to communicate with our neighbors. I, my English and my words are never gonna be as pretty as other candidates in here. I didn't spend my life on a radio show. I didn't also spend my, my time in, in other, in, in other uh, communicating that well. But you know, you know my heart is in the right place and that's not a, a shot to Billy. I love you, man, I really do. Uh, but you know, I, I, you know, it is never, uh, you know, it, my, my heart is in the right place. My words are never going to be as pretty as others. But you, I will never treat you as, uh, as if I knew better. I am not arrogant. I don't come to the table uh, you know, thinking that I know the answers, that I can tell you what your answers, what your solutions are. I come to the table to listen to you. My campaign in the last two and a half months is, uh, spent a lot of work. Myself, I was knocking on doors all day today. I was knocking on doors uh, every day for the last <laughs> two months. My campaign is trying to get people engaged, people voting. Uh, so I, a neighbor asked me yesterday, why are you trying so hard to get this? And I am trying so hard to get this is because I care. It's all about you. It's all about bringing solutions to the table. It's all about getting people to vote. People don't vote in municipal elections as much as, as they should. And this district has the lowest voter turnout in the city. And that hurts me because I know that people care about this community as much as we all do here. So that's what I bring to the table. Uh, I don't know how long I spoke for. Um, Turner, you probably have this. And you know, I don't know if I, need, if I can answer any questions, uh, but I would love to. Yeah, we still have uh, 11 minutes. Oh my goodness. 14 I, minutes. For, so, right, Turner, you, do you say, do you allow uh, questions to be asked? Yes, absolutely. That was the goal. Uh, does anyone have a question? Yes, I do, actually. My name is Janessa. Um, I have a question for you, Alejandro, about um, the other side village and your thoughts on that. And then also what it sounds like they want to do something with the raging waters um, as well. I've heard um, some talk about that also becoming a homeless, um, you know, to help the, the unsheltered as well. So I just wanted to know where you stand on, on these issues about the other side village, the location of it, et cetera, and how that impacts our community. Look, the, the, so in general, uh, in general, let me preface the answer to this uh, by saying that what the city is doing right now is not working. Uh, you know, pushing the, the homeless and unsheltered people from one corner of the district to another one is not working. It is not a solution. It's kicking the can down the road. We actually tow in people's vehicles right now when when there are when the neighbors complain about this issue. And it's what what is happening when we tow their vehicles that are going to go live in, in a tent in the park or in the trail. Or, you know, so like none of these things that the city is doing right now is short-sighted and it's not working. Um, it is not enough. So 
that is the preface to the question. Uh, now, uh, on this specific, the village, in general, I support the idea of having housing. I actually traveled to Seattle and to Denver to look into this issue and to learn from experts, 30-year experts on homeless issues, uh, and to tour their uh, teeny home communities. I toured two teeny home communities in Seattle. I also visited a few of the facilities in Denver to learn about what they're doing. To be, said, to, to be fair, Seattle or Denver haven't solved this issue. Solving this issue is much more complex, right? The, you know, you can not say that, but like we can also learn from their mistakes and some of their successes. And just saying, you know, just saying we don't want this in our neighborhood is hard for me to, 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 to side with that because they're already living in our neighborhoods. They're already living in our parks. They're already living in our trails. So, so that is short-sighted. And I think, uh, I think there is something to, to say about uh, housing and to, to try to, to make sure that this works. Now, there are some concerns, for example, the size of it. You know, I, I know that this, the, the project wants to start very slow, very small, and they want to make sure that it works. The other side academy uh, told the candidates that they want to use this as the example because they want to build three or four in the state of Utah. They want to build one in, in Provo. They want to build, build one in, in Davis County and they want to build one in St. George. So they want to use this one as their success story. And uh, they're also using this, uh, they have uh, success stories with this in, in, in Austin, Texas. So uh, this has been done before. Uh, they have a track record, and I'm I'm generally supportive of it. But it is the council right now, next week, who will have to decide on some of these things, and it will be before me, uh, before uh, if I have the opportunity to serve. Uh, but in general, I support the idea because what we're doing right now is not solving anything. So if someone tells you that they don't support this, they should tell you what they're going to do. What they're going to do to 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 help the people in the in the trails? What they're going to do to help the people in the park? I have to pick up needles from my front porch. I they need to tell you what is going to happen. No more excuses. So that is my my general answer on that on the village. Thank you. Uh, next question. I have a question. Okay, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, no, my question is, we just experienced an incident about 15 minutes ago where an individual had parked themselves inside of a tree area and lit a fire. Um, and the warm, quote unquote, warming fire was what it was called. And then my partner, or Jared, called and then the fire department or whomever, what was it, Jared? Said the police said it was a warming fire and not to, uh, we can't do anything about it because it wasn't next to a building. But in essence, does everybody remember Northern California? <laughs> I mean, we're in Salt Lake City and we're like near our home, our home. And I went over to the place and uh, the gentleman or whomever it was in there, it was like, I thought it was a dead body. So this person had parked themselves in there, but the fact is that the fire department or police department kind of ignored that when cities had been burned down like Lake Tahoe and all of that. Um, I, I'm a little bit confused as to who do you talk to about something like that. This was really disturbing. I'm not being dramatic or anything like that, but that happened. We, I went over there and I thought the guy was dead or the person. So I'm, I'm wondering, actually, this is a question for everybody. What would someone like me do about that? Well, I, I know that the city doesn't, uh, the fire department doesn't allow for open fires and they especially close to, to uh, you know, trees or Jordan River Trail because especially during the, 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 the dry season, I was meet, talking to a few friends that work for the fire department and they were telling me, this is earlier in the year and it's been raining a lot lately, but uh, that they were very concerned about the Jordan River Trail becoming uh, hazardous uh, as far as like a, 
a fire corridor that could like ignite uh, and just like creep in through the na through neighborhoods basically uh, and that was very interesting to me and, and and very dangerous and obviously i think that the 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 underlying pro problem we have is people living outside and not having uh, shelter uh, and you know they they have to uh, go to have they have to have uh, warming fires and and uh, the city basically has basically decided that these things are okay in the west side i know that they will tell you that that's not true uh, but you know i i cannot help it i you know anybody that comes to the west side knows that they, they, there is a double standard about this and if they tell you differently as an excuse uh, is, it really is an excuse about this. The power is in the east side. The interest in this is in the side, and the administration most 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 likely most like they live in the east side, and you know it feels like the west side is what everything is allowed to happen, and that is that doesn't fly with me. That doesn't fly with me. I I, I had a friend who jokingly told me, well, you know, when I was complaining, he works for the city. Uh, and he jokingly told me, well, you moved to the bad part of town. And that to me, that sentence is outrageous by itself because this is not the bad part of town. Is I think is one of the most beautiful part of towns. And, you know, and I think that general idea that this is the bad part of town. So all of those things have to okay to happen is part of the, the problem. As we have, we need a city that is attentive, responsive, and that is not making excuses about the little things and some of the big things. Uh, yeah. and, 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 that, and that's it. Oh, that was my time? No, 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 no. I didn't mean your time. Oh. Um, I, I'm kind of at that point, like this just happened. And it's like, what would someone like me do? Because the police uh, just said <laughs> that they couldn't do anything. And I am totally, completely on board. I watch it every day, but this is a human thing. It's not a city thing. It's a human thing. These folks are absolutely this. I felt badly because I tore this guy's whole tent apart thinking that he was dead because it was so heavy. So it's a human thing. So yeah. what do we do when the police say, I know that you said that, but when the police say that uh, it's a warming fire and it's okay if it's not an extra building. But then I'm thinking my parents had to evacuate from a fire uh, like two times. And, uh, you know, friends of mine and aunt who her house got burnt down in Santa Rosa. And I'm thinking, do we not see that? I mean, oh, well, yeah. Every, this. I, 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 you know, it's a human, it's very human to, to all of us, I think. I mean, like, look, I, I carry naloxone in my car now because you know earlier this uh, earlier this year I had to like give naloxone to someone you know around around my my house. I mean like it is close to us. It's very close to us. Uh, and what do we do? I think it is a city thing. Is we need to ask the city to actually take this as an urgent matter. You know they just push this like humans from one corner of the city to the next one and and i know that it's easier said than done but the city uh, it's going to have a lot of money now uh that has never been allocated and and now the city decided what to do with the money there was a press conference and you know it's still not enough they're not even putting enough of that money into this onto these issues and you know if you see if you see how they want to split the money uh, you know, and some of those projects are great, but are they urgent is the question. Are they urgent? And living people living in the streets uh, is probably one of the biggest catastrophes that, you know, as someone that came from a third world country, uh, you know, to, to the most powerful country arguably in the world, and we have uh, hundreds of people living in our streets, it hurts me and it shouldn't be like that. So uh, as far as what we do, I think we should elect leaders that have the courage to ask the right questions. And I, I'm going to move on to the next question. Um, Carrie, would you mind asking your question next? Carrie, are you still there? I'm Carrie. Yes. Um, so, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, I'm wondering when did you move to this neighborhood and where did you grow up and, and go to school? I yeah, moved to the neighborhood over four years ago. I lived in Salt Lake for about 11 years now. Um, I went to school at BYU. Um, don't judge me for that. Uh, I, uh, um, I uh, um, 
so yeah, I think those those are very specific questions. So I think there is a lot to 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 elaborate on those, unless you have a follow up. Uh, we have three minutes left, uh, two minutes left with with Alejandro. Any other questions? Well, I uh, okay. The last question. I promise it'll be like ten seconds long. Uh, what do I do when a police? I, I'm going to come back to this in the next uh, after Alejandro's time, because we we I have an answer for someone from the city. So we're doing a candidate forum, and this is Alejandro's time. So uh, if it's not related to Alejandro's campaign, I'm going to address it in the break. Oh, wait. So Alejandro is having a campaign. Yes. Um, any other I'm questions, failing. Alejandro? Uh, I'm failing completely. Fail. I have I have a campaign you own. Yes, you could say that. Any any questions? I would love to. If not, I can talk your ear off for the next three minutes or whatever is left. Yeah. You want to give us? I'd two? like to ask a question. Oh, go ahead. Um, what's the reason that you're running for office? Is there something that you'd like to be that you'd like to? Uh, So the only part I heard was why am I running? Is that the only is that is that what I heard? Why I'm why I'm running? Uh, basically, yeah. Why are you running? What would you like to have done while you're in office? Is there something that is a pet project of yours that you want to see done? Okay. So why I'm running? Uh, I'm running because I care about this community. I don't have to be doing this right, right now, but I couldn't just sit in the sidelines and let let uh let this let's keep on happening in our neighborhoods i uh you know i'm you know running out of frustration but you're not when i when i send flyers and i'm talking about the issues that the neighbors are telling me there was uh, a friend of mine that told me uh that you know much of much of the, the campaign that i'm i'm saying is you're reflecting some of the issues we know that we're frustrated we know that we are not being heard by the city why are you saying those things it's because the neighbors are telling me that but my campaign is pivoting to solutions. If you see my website, it has specific solutions for the next two years. And arguably I'm the only campaign here that has specific things you know, for to accomplish in the next two years. Now we have an incredible, incredible opportunity now in the next two years, uh, because this is a short term, right? We're in the middle of Andrew's, and I believe Andrew was here a minute ago. Uh, uh, you know, we're in the middle of Andrew's term. So we have an opportunity to ask the council member that gets elected this year, what do you do in the, in the last year and a half? What do you accomplish? And, uh, and, uh, and I think that is a good opportunity uh, to, to, to get things done. It's a good opportunity for district to start pushing for solutions. And this is not about singing Kumbaya and saying, oh my goodness, we solve all the problems. It is about showing to the neighbors that the city could be responsive, that the city can actually listen. And what about, as far as pet uh -huh. projects. We're, we're at time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we put a link to Alejandro's campaign website in the chat. So we direct you there. And then I'm uh, sure Alejandro would be, be happy to answer your private questions if you want to send them in the chat. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, with that, we'll get started with Nigel. Good evening, Glendale. Thank you very much for having me. I cannot tell you how happy I am to be at Glendale Community Council because I grew up here. This is my neighborhood. Um, my parents uh, moved us here from Jamaica uh, to Salt Lake when I was uh, about six years old. Uh, we lived in Rose Park for a, a little over a year and then we were able to get a house on Ninth West across from the Liquor Commission. I went to Riley Elementary, I went to Glendale Junior High, the, the old one, not the new one that you guys have. And I went to South High School. I was the second to the last graduating class uh, before it was shut down in 1989 was um, when it was closed, 88 was the last year. Uh, the reason that I'm running is I understand uh, the neighborhood. I understand the equity issues that this side of town has faced in Salt Lake. And I'm concerned about a number of issues. At the very top of them is public safety. Uh, and when I look at public safety, it's not just crime, but it's also fires like Aaron mentioned and 
uh, street safety. And we had a horrible crash in Fair Park where I live now over the weekend. Some of, my, some of you may have heard about it. And it's just one of those things that has happened on the West Side far too often, especially over the last uh, couple of years. So public safety is one of my top priorities. Addressing the homelessness issue is another one. Uh, the inland port, uh, I, I don't know how much um, activity there has been on the inland port in Glendale and Fair Park and, and Rose Park. It's been a top priority. And of course, affordable housing. Um, I want to hit on a couple of points real quick uh, in regards to public safety I, in terms of my plan and being very specific about that. Um, one is to fund the police department so that they can, we're, we're uh, underfunded and understaffed in the police department by about 60 officers. It's probably a little bit higher than that. Uh, I've advocated to expand the ambassador program these are the sorts of people, Aaron, that you could call if they were in your neighborhood uh, when you encounter what you did tonight instead of the police. They're uniformed. They have um, uh, the naloxone on them. They, they have uh, ways to offer aid to the homeless as well as be a uniform presence on the streets. And uh, the last one is uh, protecting parks and public assets. And I'm glad that, to hear um, that part of the, the mayor's priorities is to fund park rangers because we need a uniform presence there uh, also for aid and for public safety. In regards to homelessness, um, we've got a problem because winter is coming and the city doesn't have a plan right now other than uh, hotel vouchers, which uh, there's not a lot of hotel uh, hotels that are willing to participate in that. We have to take a look at the idea of sanctioned camping. Uh, this would be a, an overnight safe space. Uh, I've identified a property that the city owns on 6 West and 300 South uh, that could be used to provide uh, space for folks where um, they could be safe from theft, uh, from violence. It would need to be fenced. I uh, need to have ambassadors going through it and it would have to have security at the front to uh, make sure that the uh, only the people that are supposed to be in there are going in there. It would be temporary, but it's something that, that we need to look at. Uh, I know that Glendale has had problems with uh, recreational vehicles, uh, especially on 17th South. I'm sorry. I think that was just um, an accident. Oh, okay. <laughs> and uh, they, they've been moved, but they've uh, dispersed throughout the valley. I think we need to reach out to our faith community, our churches who have parking lots and ask them to take up to three of those vehicles. Um, and they'd be able to provide aid, make that human connection that is uh, necessary. And then by providing these uh, safe spaces for the, uh, the campers and for the people in RVs, uh, it would allow us to enforce uh, the laws on our streets and in our city. So I'm gonna open it up to questions at this point um, and uh, you can ask me anything. Uh, Nigel, I think just to have things start similarly, would you mind just talking about the other side village really quickly? Sure. Uh, I've had the opportunity to interact with the Other Side Academy for several years now. Uh, I think their program is uh, effective and impressive. Uh, about six weeks ago, I went over there with a group from Poplar Grove residents who were very concerned about it. And once you see how they operate, uh, it becomes a very different thing than just another resource center. Uh, if this was another provider operating it, I would be very opposed to it, uh, especially, uh, again, concentrating 400 deeply affordable units on the west side. But I, I like the operator. I like the amenities that uh, they're going to be bringing in terms of a grocery store, uh, public spaces, uh, theaters, meeting places. So I, this is something that I support under those conditions. 
Thank you. I, I cut someone off and I apologize for that. Uh, Turner, you're okay. It was, uh, I didn't realize the form, so my apologies. Oh, it's okay. Um, uh, next question for Nigel. Go ahead and jump in, whoever wants to go next. Okay, I'm gonna um, ask a follow-up question, Nigel. This is Shanessa again. Um, with respect to the other side village, um, I know that I heard Alejandro talk about how their success models in Austin, um, Denver, and Seattle, and I really appreciate uh, you guys visiting with the other side academy and talking to them. Um, that being said, Austin's, uh, you know, Austin's tiny home village is located 20 miles outside of Austin, and it's working. So my question to all the candidates would be why us, like why this village, why four blocks from my home, why the gauntlet on Indiana, um, 400 people struggling with mental health issues and substance abuse, um, that is wildly concerning. And I understand that we already have, um, you know, those unsheltered people living here currently. And I am an absolute advocate for this program to, to work. Um, but I'm concerned about where it's being put. Um, additionally, I think that it needs to be said that the, the stakes are very different for the other side academy and for the other side village. Um, we're dealing with people facing life sentences and convictions versus people that are accustomed to living on the streets. So talk to me about your, your thoughts on that. So it, let me make sure I'm understanding your, your question. You're asking why that location was chosen versus another location. Sorry, is let me correct? clarify. So like my question is, um, since Austin is 20 miles outside of Austin and it is working, um, no one disputes that. Why does it need to be right here four blocks from our home um, with 400 people? So that's, that's my concern. Okay, I, I know that uh, the Indiana Avenue site wasn't their first choice. Uh, their first choice was uh, some state land up by the university uh, next to uh, Hogel Zoo, actually. Um, it, it, it boils down to they have a vision that requires a certain amount of space, and it's really the only uh, available property in Salt Lake that the city owns. And that's why um, they've chosen that site. Um, I've gone over there and looked at it and I, I see it as being far enough away from a uh, residential neighborhood. Uh, I also see it as um, how it's currently being used, which has been a landfill. So it's not being used at all. Um, I see, I, I would rather have something than nothing on land. And so that's, that's kind of where I'm coming from on it. Um, there was a, a, a very a lively discussion about your second point, and that is the residents who were there um, and what happens if they don't make the program. And most of the, the folks from Poplar Grove that went with us bought into the idea that um, these folks aren't just going to go and camp out in front of that location. They're mo more than likely um, going to go back to where they were camping before or whoever they were staying with before. And the other side village folks uh, agreed that they would take people who don't remain in the program back to where they were. Does that help? A bit, yes. Thank you for answering that question. Okay. With that, I'm going to move on to the next one. Paulo, do you want to ask your question? Uh, yeah, hello. Um, what's your vision for Glendale? Have you had a five year timeline? Uh, that is a very good question. Um, it's been really interesting seeing how much Glendale has changed. Um, since I grew up over here, especially 
uh, the single family neighborhoods that have uh, been built around the Jordan River by the, um, uh, oh, what is that, uh, the Peace Labyrinth. I, somebody told me about that. I'm like, what's that? I don't even know what that is. So I, I went over there um, and uh, checked it out. Uh, I really like a lot of things about Glendale as it is. Um, one of the big challenges obviously is the uh, former raging water site. And um, it's going to become a, a regional park. That's the feedback that that the residents around here have provided. So I'm excited about that. But in terms of uh, a bigger vision, uh, what I think Glendale needs is its own high school. I think it's uh, completely inequitable and unfair that the kids in Glendale, the high school students in Glendale have to be bused to East High School. And being a, a South High graduate, it irks me to see East High banners on California Avenue. So in terms of uh, the, the big thing that I see for Glendale, it would be getting a high school where those kids um, have, will have equal access to after-school programs, to uh, extracurricular activities and not have to worry about a bus or getting a ride home across town. And there are properties on Redwood Road that are large enough. I had originally thought that the Raging Water site be a perfect uh, place for a high school. But when I learned about the constraints on it, I, we're gonna have to look for a different place, but I would like to see a, a West Side High School for the South End of District Two. Do you see it replacing the golf course potentially? I don't. Um, and I am, uh, I, though I haven't done it recently, I am a golfer, and if you're if you're a golfer, you understand the the beauty of our golf courses, uh, the affordability that they have, and the the ability to just get away from it all, even though you're in the city. So, I'm opposed to converting golf courses or removing golf courses, but I am in favor of looking at public private partnerships to maybe. Um, improve the, the clubhouse facilities so that there's more meeting spaces for uh, people, for residents. Uh, this is particularly true of Glendale's Golf Course and Rose Park. In terms of your stance on housing, um, we know we're all experiencing a ton of growth. How, what's your vision for accommodating that growth? Um, mixed housing or, or kind of like, what's your approach to the levels of density that we're expecting? Well, I think makes sense. Incremental density is where we have to start. And it's interesting going around the neighborhoods. Uh, I, I ran into an 11 plex the other night. No, I'm sorry, it was an eight plex. Just in the middle of uh, single family homes. This is in Fair Park. But I, and I know that uh, Glendale homes are, uh, are uh, larger lots typically. I know the house that I grew up in was uh, 0.33 acres and it's very deep. Um, so we have to look at what makes sense for the neighborhood. I favor higher density in transit areas and I favor home ownership opportunities. So condos instead of apartments so that everybody has a chance to build equity and uh, build a, a future for uh, uh, the next generation coming up. Uh, I think there are opportunities for accessory dwelling units in single family neighborhoods, whether they be uh, attached or inside basements. And I would like to see uh, on some of these larger lots uh, where you have a rundown home, maybe some infill that would allow for uh, two homes or a duplex or a twin home instead of another single family home. Thank you. Uh, next question. Uh, Kim, uh, Kimberly, I saw that you put a question in the chat. Do you want to ask it?
Uh, Nigel, if you want to continue talking about different positions, I don't see any other questions right now. Uh, well, I'm looking at this question, if, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. Sure. Uh, your vision on economic development and I like what your vision is for kind of like bringing in things that draw in a little more like retail opportunity for small businesses and things, things of that nature, like coffee shops, bars, anything like that. Yeah, I see that as a, a as a great opportunity, and I've been working on it uh, on North Temple. Uh, I, I'm a real estate agent by trade. I do commercial and residential, and I helped uh, uh, an owner acquire the former Wiener Schnitzel. It's going to be redeveloped at some point, but instead of letting it rot like some of the other buildings on that strip, I insisted that we lease it and find somebody to go in there. And it, Given the amount of crime um, that was there, it, it took a long time and we had to make a lot of concessions, but we brought somebody in there. Um, Love NT has been there for two months now. And it's a, I polled um, the residents as to what kind of business they wanted to see in that location. And they said a, a coffee shop, breakfast, you know, something that, had, that isn't in the neighborhood. So that's what we got. Uh, so I think there's opportunities there. I think the city can provide opportunities, uh, especially in properties that they own. I mean, imagine if they if there's a lot of city-owned property on the west side that has been uh, neglected. Raging Waters, obviously, Fisher mentioned the Overnighter Motel on North Temple, that if we activate them somehow, um, then it's going to be better. It's going to create opportunities for small businesses and it's going to be it's going to create amenities and opportunities for the community so i'm a big believer in that the city has a facade improvement program um, that's a, a grant program i think that's something that should be expanded they've tested it at different areas around the city but it's always been geographically limited and i i think any opportunity that we can have to encourage entrepreneurialism is going to be important Okay, and I have a follow-up to that that's very specific. And, sure. And, yeah. Um, if you had a clean slate for the parcel that Smith's on 9th West sits on, and you had a chance to redevelop that, what would you see that site become? Uh, the one I'm just, sorry on, to put uh, on the spot. I'm just wondering. I'm just curious at this point. The, the one on 9th, uh, 9th West and 9th South, between 8th and 9th South. Yes. So that is, that is a great question. I have seen um, ideas that um, planning students have put forth. They had an open house, I think two or three years ago uh, at, at, over at uh, Square Kitchen, which is right on that street. Um, so I know that there are some ideas for it. For me, I really like mixed use, uh, but I don't know if that would be the right thing for that block. Um, there are, uh, if you look at the Lee's market on uh, 300 North and 4th West or uh, the Harmons in Holiday, they have a concept where you have a smaller grocery store with uh, different items in it with other types of retail, or in that case, it was um, in the instance in, in uh, Guadalupe, it's uh, housing. So uh, that's such a big block. I mean, there's a couple things that you could do there in terms of mixed use. I would like to see more retail. We ha had this discussion about uh, the food uh, desert I, that is Joel, retail. Yeah. We're, we're at time. Okay. All right. Uh, so we're going to go and move on to uh, Billy, who is next on our agenda. Thanks, Nigel. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. You know, the most common thing said in this era is um, you're you're still on mute. I started talking with my mute button still on, of course. So hi, I'm Billy Palmer. Um, I've been living in Glendale pretty much my whole life. Uh, I have raised my kids here. I have three boys and always uh, have considered that my most important job. Um, I am a community organizer. I am an advocate for youth empowerment, homeownership, uh, survivors of violence, 
Uh, and I find those things to be, in my own opinion, uh, good qualities and things that I should be very proud of, actually. Uh, I've also partnered and organized around many issues, including creating more access and amplifying the voices of Westsiders uh, through my organizing and through my work at KRCL uh, that I'm very proud of. I did a show called Radioactive for uh, five years as a, as a journalist uh, and also as a documenter of uh, many big giant issues like homelessness um, and housing and you name it. So. I'm also known for being a community advocate for the West Side. Uh, that's the thing I'm most known for. Anyways, I feel I'm known for being uh, effective and uh, effective with really important big issues like the North Temple Tracks line that wasn't intended to stop on the West Side. Uh, let's see, pushing for the county to build a new facility uh, in our neighborhood, uh, the Northwest Multipurpose Center. That was a long and uh, hard fight, but we got that done. Amenities for the Sorensen Center that is still now just being implemented. That was a long fight. Uh, I don't give up on things. And uh, I've been known to have a real track record and a person that fights for this neighborhood for a really long time. So I am known to get uh, people engaged. Uh, partnering is an important part of uh, organizing. And uh, I've... Uh, I've learned that skill set over 20 years, and I appreciate the energy and care for from all the candidates here, and I am more than uh, pretty words, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, I do uh, appreciate um, that as a compliment. I think it's a compliment, I guess. Uh, I appreciate that he's all, that Ollie is uh, also doing uh, a little what have I, I've been doing. We've been knocking on doors. I've been doing that for months now and um, listening to people. And we both have long lists and concerns, uh, specific concerns from people. Uh, and we've been documenting that. I feel where I stand out from uh, all of my candidates is, uh, excuse me, opponents is a record of effective change. Um, and, uh, and knowing how to create change. And we, um, we change uh, things together as neighbors. And that's what I've always known uh, our neighborhood to be, not just uh, a place where we have uh, issues and, and, and a list of things, but um, this, this neighborhood has a history of uh, people that get together, get organized and do big things. And I, and I want everybody to know that, uh, that that's the history of this neighborhood. And that's the legacy of so many of us in this neighborhood, I have many, many mentors. Uh, in this neighborhood that, uh, and so do so do many of you have uh, mentors in this neighborhood that have done um, so much for this community. And we wouldn't live in a Glendale that we love so much were it not for all those folks. And I count myself among them. So I'm proud of that work. Um, I've done, uh, I fully expect, uh, obviously, uh, for Pui uh, to uh, stay engaged in community. I, however, um, believe that uh, your first role in community work uh, shouldn't be um, city council. So uh, that's why I'm running. I feel I'm running on a track record and an effective track record. Uh, by the way, uh, my involvement started when I was a teenager. I was 16 year old, years old and I was uh, building low income housing for uh, families uh, that would not normally afford it. Uh, so while I have a long track record, I'm still young. <laughs> I just started young. Uh, so I want people to know that, um, you know, it's not time to put me out the pasture yet. <laughs> I've heard on here that uh, uh, I've been described as a career politician. I have never uh, ran for office or excuse me, I've never held office. So um, this would be my first opportunity to be city council. Uh, also, I want people to know um, that uh, I want to be a city council person um, that builds bridges, uh, that gets people involved, that works as a team uh, member, not just top down. I want people. Uh, I want to provide inclusion to for for people. Um, I know what it's like to feel locked out uh, and uh, to to fight really hard to to get on the teams that create change um, through the city, through elected officials, and all that. Uh, I I like teamwork and. Um, uh, let's see, I want to finish the work that we've already done, um, that we've started. Uh, when we started the West Side Master Plan, it's not finished. And uh, it was it's kind of ignored parts of it, like our economic development. I want to see businesses all along Glendale. I grew up in a Glendale where you walked down the street to, for almost any amenity you needed. And now we mostly drive to get to department stores, to get to cafes, to get to breweries. And I want to see that on our side of town. So that's really important to me. 
And I have a hard time with, with people saying that uh, things never change. Um, I know that we can change things. I know we have changed big things in this neighborhood. I've lived here long enough to know um, how to come out of big, hard uh, eras and big, hard um, um, economic uh, downturns and, and all of that. And so I want to continue the work. That's what I want to do. That's what I've been doing in my neighborhood. And I want to do it at the city county level. And that's why I think I should be the first choice as city councilman. And I want to leave it, try to leave it short so I can answer some questions. So thanks for listening. How would you guys like to start uh, the questions? Do you want me to answer some of the ones that have already been asked? Um, I do actually have a question or kind of a semi comment about that. Um, I think what is, uh, am I on speaker? So oh, I can't be heard. Okay. I can hear you. I muted. I didn't say any cuss words. But uh, <laughs> the other day, I was having issue with 900 West. Ninth West, uh, just with like this traffic thing and Turner, you and I have spoken about like kind of just what that might mean to kind of create some sort of thing. Like you were correct, Nigel, about that accident. There were four of them that we saw. I also got rear-ended. So anyway, long story short, uh, that, that actually happens here because it's too fast and people I think have a weird um, offensive driving habit versus defensive here. And so we were talking about calming. Well, I walked up and down the street as instructed to go and find out like what people's opinions were. And two people actually told me, good luck. You know, you're not gonna hear anything. You're good luck. No one's going to listen to you. And I actually was like, that is bullshit. I mean, that that's ridiculous. Um, I was told- I'd like to get your question, Aaron. So we can, I'd like to get your question. Yeah, okay. So I'm wondering exactly how do you, how do you appeal to the people who don't have faith? They don't think anything, how, how would you do that? Um, well, uh, one, uh, it starts with what you just said you did. Um, I've walked up and down all of Northwest and I've asked very specifically about the, the uh, road diet changes. It's a mixed bag. People feel like um, it's not good. Some people think it is good. Uh, some people have comments and this is where I think it's really important to understand is uh, the solutions may be to reverse uh, or the solutions may be to do bump outs on different corners. But the one thing that's, that's for sure important is to understand, um, like you said, what the data says. Are we having more accidents because we tried to do something good and we're, we, we um, instead have something that doesn't work? Did we not take into consideration that there's a train at the end of that night, the West? And so that's how traffic gets backed up. And that's what's causing a lot of the bumper thumpers. Did we uh, not do this in an equitable way where we remember that the West side is different than the East side in the fact that we have trains along our roads that uh, add complications to our traffic. So those are big questions that we need to make uh, to, 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 ha to ask. And we need to make sure that, um, you know, even though we've tried something, we don't continue with it because, you know, for prideful reasons to say we change something for the better and we want to make sure that people think it's better. We want to make sure the roads are safer. And to tell you the truth, down Navajo, down Emory, I'm hearing from neighbors um, all over the city, I mean, excuse me, the west side of, I've walked uh, every single neighborhood. Uh, people have complaints about speeding cars down every single road. So my plan is to do a, a, a safety assessment uh, once I become council me member and uh, and to create, um, you know, places where we need to have speed bumps, have them. Places where we need to remind people to slow down, we need to have those. We need to do speed traps on, on lanes where people speed through um, as well. So we need yeah. to make sure that we're educating people uh, about the safety of our streets and what and what needs to happen is educate folks on the fact that you shouldn't be speeding down the streets as well. So no. there's, there's, there's a lot to that question as far as street safety and yeah, to tell no, you the I truth, with, I, isn't the only one. I invested my own personal money into trying to do kind of whatever they called it. And my stuff got stolen and thrown in the trash. And it was, uh, try, I mean, I, I, I spent a couple hundred dollars to try to stop traffic from being like that 
the food bank is right down here on the corner. They succeed. So I'm just curious as to what kind of plan. Our street is a really, really, really odd conduit. And so I have addressed it before and said it. Um, there are kids playing with balls out in the street. 50% of the, the responsibility is on, you know, it is on the parents um, who do not have fences. I mean, I saw a three-legged dog the other day and I'm wondering when it's gonna go yeah. down to two. Aaron, do you, mind if, do you mind if I make sure that we are asking questions about what we can do as far as the campaign. I think that I have, I have such a short amount of time. I wanna make sure I'm, talk, I'm able to talk to and address everybody's questions. I understand advertising, trust me. So I will go ahead and retract everything I've asked. Go ahead and advertise. I, I think I answered your question actually as well. Uh, you I, didn't, but that's okay. Well, I, I had hoped to, to talk about it, make creating an assessment for, for sure. our, our side of town and and uh, going from there as well. I, I, I apologize if I hadn't answered your question well enough. No, it's, it's fine. Okay, uh, uh, what, what other questions do we have? Hey, Billy, I have a question. Uh, my name is Matthew, and I just was curious if you would support, uh, once on the council, the idea of, of doing some re, uh, rezoning of Salt Lake or the opportunity to zone for more high density housing in the city, which seems to be somewhat limited. And just curious on your thoughts about changing some of the zoning in Salt Lake. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's a lot, a lot of it is about rezoning. And uh, we, let's take a look at 9th and 9th. Uh, it's been rezoned uh, to create business nodes. And if you notice, some of those businesses are, are in places that were existing houses. Uh, they've been really creative about uh, making sure that neighborhood has the amenities for the people that live nearby. So rezoning is, a yeah, very important. High density is necessary for a growing city and a comprehensive high density is what I would call for with mixed use. Um, it makes sense that along North Temple, we create more high density. It makes sense that if we're gonna build new bit, uh, new areas in, in, our, in our, like say, for example, um, the golf course, the, the neighbors, I think it's up to the neighbors to decide the neighbors decide we need more housing. Uh, we have a lot of folks renting right now that really wanna buy houses in the neighborhood and they're renting in the neighborhood and hoping something becomes open. So density is important, yes. When we talk about the Tejeda um, market, there's a there's a, a elderly facility nearby, uh, right next door to it. We need to make sure those folks can still get to their groceries. And so we could zone where that could be living and uh, mixed use, you know? so. But um, high density in, in places that are traditionally not, putting up three stories with absolutely no parking next to uh, uh, homes in a residential area takes away all the parking on the street from them. So we gotta be sensitive about uh, density, but we, we do need uh, high density. Uh, is there another part of your question that I need to answer as well? Uh, no, you did great. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. Um, I, the tiny home village has been addressed. Did you, did you want me to make some comment on that? Sure. Um, the tiny home village, uh, like Alipuri, I've been able to visit um, outside of town, tiny home villages as well. Uh, I really appreciate that he's done that work. I've also, uh, like I have mentioned, I've done um, radio documentaries. So I've, I've talked with people experiencing homelessness uh, quite a bit. Uh, in my work, and I've talked with you know everybody from there to the the federal um, the uh, the president's homeless czar, <laughs> you know, and and been able to have conversation with him, uh, as well as city council folk and mayors, and and not only our mayors but mayors across um, the country about um, solutions for homelessness and high density. I mean, excuse me, uh, the tiny home village. To me, I feel like we need to keep an open mind about it. I don't like being nimby about things that could be uh, benefits to a community. I like what they promise, um, but I do feel like we have to hold them to what they're promising if we do decide uh, that this is that it's the best use, uh, that land is the best use for it as well. Um, but I will tell you, when you talk to folks who are homeless, there's a lot of folks out there that have lived uh, a life for years not feeling connection, trying to build community within their tent communities or what have you. Um, 
And a sense of belonging and community it brings uh, a person's uh, uh, life and humanity back to them. And so when you have programs that could uh, provide um, that sense of community, along with community, um, with the uh, accountability, peer accountability, those are some of the best practices that you can have uh, in serving homeless folk. And so I do not want to uh, be nimby about it. I want to keep an open mind about it. Uh, it is a program that would be uh, new to the people doing it, uh, and it would be new to the city. And so we do have to walk uh, carefully through the process. But do I feel like a tiny home village is a good idea? Generally, yes, absolutely. I feel like it's a great idea. Does anybody want any else on that? It's a quiet party. Sorry, I'm, um, if I may, Billy, I spoke with you. You came to my house. It was great speaking to you. Um, just really quickly, if you could elaborate on, I think one thing you touched on when I saw you was perhaps location of the tiny home village. Um, you weren't sold on that. Can you talk more about that? Uh, yes, absolutely. I don't feel uh, as though the process was. We checked everywhere we could possibly think to find a place for it. Uh, there wasn't a lot of sites looked at in, in order for it to be there. We do have um, what looks like is going to be some permanent um, homeless shelter uh, is going to be also on our side of town. Uh, when we talk about, and this is part of the, this is part of it. I mean, if it provides livable wages for people and they're housed, we're, we're not talking about ho only homeless services anymore. We're also talking about economic development and, and something that could benefit the community. So when we talk about that, um, we really have to stop and think about what most West Siders will tell you when they're really being honest. And that is this side of town, yet again, uh, we have you know eight halfway houses, we have a, a number of things, and and of course, when um, they when they took down the road home, I think most people knew that North Temple and the river would be um, would be the the place that most people went. We have the most green space on this side of town. Uh, we have the most open space on this side of town, and so we knew that these issues would come, and we didn't address them as we went along. And it, I feel like part people feel like there is not equity in considering where we put things as far as low-income housing or high, high amounts of low-income housing. Um, you know, we, we figured we'd probably have a homeless shelter here some, at some point, and that's coming. And um, this tiny home village is uh, something that I think a lot of neighbors feel, um, you know, we, did we consider, and I think that's the question to be asked. I'm not gonna say that it's absolutely true that it should be somewhere else or could be somewhere else. But we need to ask those questions of whether or not they really looked, if, if this is exactly the best place for it to be, or if there's somewhere better it could be, um, if it's closer to services um, and all of that, or is it partly because uh, we see that the West Side kind of gets, um, well, I've, I, I have to be honest, I feel like the, the West Side honestly gets, and I think most neighbors uh, know this historically, we just, we don't get the same considerations equitably as the east side, um, and, it, and it shows in our in our economic development as well. Uh, we've watched new business nodes go away, and we haven't zoned for for that, and we haven't put the investment that we've put into the other neighborhoods for economic development. Um, but it's not too; it's pretty quick that we put like you know facilities for reforming prisoners right here on our side of town, and there's a lot of them. So. I don't mean to go negative there, but uh, equity is a conversation we have at the door every day. When I talk to most neighbors, 80% of all my neighbors at some point will say, what about treating the west side like we do the east side? So I think that's something we really do have to address. Thank you. Uh, we are coming up to the end of your time. Do you have 30 more seconds of something you'd like to say? Yeah, I, I want to I want people to really vote um, not only on the fact that we have a list of things that, that are concerns uh, that we absolutely do. I want people to understand that on my website, you can go our policies are listed as a vision. 
Uh, and, and that was on purpose. I, you know, I do have a vision for our community. You can find it at uh, billypalmerslc.com. And um, I, I want you to know that we can do big things, great things. We've done it before here on this side of town and we can do it together. And that's the most important thing about this the side of town. We've done amazingly big things on this side of town and we need to be, to, to be together on this. And so I invite all of the candidates when this is all said and done, no matter who wins, we've got to work as a team and really fight for this neighborhood. And that's what I want to do. Uh, with that, we are going to move on to council member Ferris. There's my mute button. Hello, everyone. How are we today? Good to hear. <laughs> it's a quiet crowd. All righty. Um, let's see. I, my name is Dennis Ferris. I am your city council representative for District 2. I was appointed in May to replace Andrew Johnston um, when he stepped aside to join the mayor's administration as director of homelessness policy. Um, I have lived here in Poplar Grove for almost 19 years now. Um, but I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about me. Um, I want to hear from you. So is there any questions? Anyone in particular want to jump on and either repeat one that you've already asked? I can certainly go through and answer some of those if no one wants to jump in. Why don't we have you start with the other side village? Okay. The other side village. Um, for the record, I know I'm going to go right back on what I just said, but, and talk about myself for a minute here. Um, I do work in homeless services. Um, I do consider myself an expert in homeless services and affordable housing, having worked with the county housing authority now called housing connect. Um, and then currently on the VOA's volunteers of America, their homeless outreach program. Um, the other side village. I am the only candidate that's expressed serious concerns and asked tough questions about this project. First and foremost, the toxicity of the land. It was the city landfill from 1920 to 1962. There is a 2018, which was not that long ago, um, EPA report that says that no further mitigation is necessary on that property so long as the area remains vacant, fenced, and no housing, schools, or playgrounds are built within 200 feet of it. First and foremost, before we talk about building 450 homes for any population, I want to know damn sure that that land is safe to be on. So um, that's the very first step. Secondly, um, there's been lots of talk of the Other Side Academy and Mobile Loaves and Fishes in Austin. The Other Side Academy has had absolutely nothing to do with the Austin project other than having visited it. Um, so sure, they have been there and they have seen it, but that's the extent of their involvement. So I'm not willing to attribute that space's success to them. Um, they do not have a track record of success, certainly not with this type of a project and not with this population. Um, the size of the project from any best practices measure it is simply dense, very dense. Um, 450 units is a lot. And to bring in 450 units for a high needs population like those suffering from chronic homelessness is extremely difficult. And I definitely worry that they might be getting in over their heads. So assuming the land is safe, I would love to see them do a incremental approach. Let's see 50 homes at a time, prove the um, proof of concept, show me that, you can make it work and then we can start to go from there. But um, let's see. And yeah, it was mentioned, I think by Janessa that Mobile Loaves and Fishes is 20 miles outside of Austin. Um, and personally, I believe that it's more successful because of that. Um, having that distance from other influences um, the Other Side Academy is certainly big on, I noticed in the chat, there was talk about um, whether or not a married couple would be, you know, one party could be a negative influence on the other party. Um, it's the same sort of thing. If you can put this 20 miles outside of Austin, it's not as convenient for your drug dealer to stop by. Um, it reduces the negative influences um, within that space and can help to make it much more successful. So... That's that. Anyone else? Anything else? Should I move on to the next one? I've got notes. <laughs> All righty. Um, Aaron, you had asked about 
um, an individual in a tree having a warming fire. Um, if someone told you when you called in to either the non-emergency or the emergency line to report that, I want to know who that is that told you that it wasn't an issue because it absolutely is an issue. There is a fire marshal order for no fireworks, no recreational fires within Salt Lake City. That's been in place since June 22nd. It is still in place now. Um, it is absolutely important that we maintain that. So um, in the event that you see something like that again, feel free to call back and insist that the fire department be sent out. And they are absolutely aware of it. Allow them to make that call. There are some instances where they may choose to make a judgment call that it is a warming fire where someone's trying to stop from freezing to death that night. However, that fire has to be safe. And what you're describing it being in a wooded area near homes, that's not a good combination. Um, and especially with someone who was um, potentially impaired, like you described. So we want to make sure that those are all safe. Um, and the fire department is well aware of that and will respond. So, um, and then you would also ask about what to do. Um, because I do work with the Homeless Outreach Program, I'm certainly well aware of what steps to take. I can give you a couple of phone numbers. I'm gonna ask Turner to maybe put this in the chat so that everyone can get it down. Um, the VOA City Homeless Outreach Team, their number is 385-266-0020. Um, that gets a hold of care coordinators. There is also, of course, the option of just calling me directly um, because I both represent the District 2 currently, but also because I work during the day with the Homeless Outreach Program at VOA. Um, and my number, 801-699-1381. Please feel free to call or text me anytime with any questions on any issue such as that. Let's see. So um, dope. Sorry, were you opening up for a question there? Councilor? Go for it. Absolutely. Um, uh, yeah, so I spent a lot of time, and I see there's a question on the chat as well about the Jordan River Trail, a lot of time on the Jordan River Trail. And yep. I've called the city several times about lights under underpasses that are burnt out or have been destroyed. And I just was curious if you could provide any insight into when, like what the maintenance schedule is on the Jordan River Trail or how to raise the issue of outed lights in the neighborhood and on the trail. Betcha. Um, it brings up an issue that's been um, very important to me for a long time to push for the city to be more responsive, more proactive in their repair schedules. Um, currently, frankly, everything is complaint based. So in the meantime, until we get enough staffing and resources available to be proactive, um, I very much recommend complaining. We have to be the squeaky wheel. So there is one, your best alternative is, your best option is the SLC mobile app. Um, it is a phone app. You download it on your phone um, called SLC mobile. Very easy to use. It um, pinpoints your location and deals with and allows you to report pretty much anything to the city. Now, if you also want to follow up on that, feel free to send me a text. Let me know. Um, I know I did have a street lights out for a neighbor that let me know. Um, turns out the lights had been on back order because as we all know, there's a heck of a back order for everything right now with 60 ships, cargo ships sitting in the um, bay on California. Um, but they were the public utilities department was able to come out and switch the entire head out for a different one that they did have a light bulb for. Um, so that we at least have an option. Claudia, I like. She's a strong supporter. Um, the there are any number of things you can report on that app, um, including concerns regarding homelessness, potholes. Um, I reported one just the other day as I too am out walking, knocking on doors, um, and it was in a crosswalk. And the response I got was very heartening. The fact that the city said, wow, this is extremely important. Thank you very much. This is so much more than, and these were their words, so much more than just faded paint in a crosswalk. I'm going to forward this personally and make sure that um, potholes, this pothole in the middle of the crosswalk is taken care of immediately. Um, so uh -huh. it can definitely work out really well. Did that answer that? Thank you very much. You betcha. All righty. Anybody else? 
Yeah. But just really quickly, Dennis, there's been some chat in the, um, there's been some conversation in the chat that I think several people would like you to address regarding your ability or inability to vote on certain issues. Will, will you address those at some point? Okay, sure. Um, I was not reading the chat as I'm here, but um, I will certainly talk about any conflicts of interest or the fact that I had to recuse myself from a, um, a vote last night because I do work with the VOA. Um, first step, the very first step after having been sworn in to join the city council, um, the first form you fill out is a conflict of interest form. It allows you to declare any possible conflicts that you have with your employer, that sort of thing. Um, we do as a general policy and, you know, moral and morality and ethics um, adhere to not participating in discussions or votes where there could be any um, semblance of personal gain. And so because, for example, last night, um, the vote on a temporary land use regulation regarding the Wigan Center um, downtown in Rio Grande Street um, to be used as possible winter overflow shelter. Um, that application was made by the VOA. I work for the VOA, therefore I recused myself, um, was not part of that vote. And so there have been so far three instances where this has occurred, one being a mitigation grant where from the city to VOA um, that very specifically, frankly, pays my salary. So of course it wouldn't be right for me to vote on that. Um, I can be part of the conversation. I can be an expert available to my fellow council members, but it's certainly not right for me to vote to allocate funding that pays me directly. So recuse myself from that one. Um, last night regarding the possible shelter there uh, at the Wigan Center. And then another one that was just a conversation that seems to have hit a dead end um, being the possible switchover or the proposed at the time switchover of the VOA detox to um, a winter overflow shelter in the future. And that issue has since been dropped. Um, but again, because it was VOA, and even though I don't directly deal with property development and that sort of thing on the within the agency. Um, it was still something that just because I'm connected with VOA, it, it wouldn't be right for me to be addressed in there. However, any other issue, I mean, certainly concerns regarding homelessness, the other side village, the, um, I believe there was mention of that I might not be able to have voted concerning the funding for the switch point um, development called the point, the previous airport in, I seconded the motion last night, voted for it. Um, absolutely, that funding needed to be allocated. So yeah, um, unless there is a direct conflict and uh, where I morally and ethically have to recuse myself, I'm absolutely going to be involved so that I can represent the community. Um, and then even if there is a conflict there, I can still be available as an expert to others in the room. Did that help? It did. Thank you very much. All righty. Thank you, Janessa. Anyone else? Um, if not, I certainly have plenty of other things to talk about as oh, well. Paolo has a question. Paolo, hit me. Um, I just typed it in the in the chat. So, um, oh, but it's essentially fine. out of the 2014 master plan. Um, are there any like specific issues that you would like to see kind of like implemented? There's a lot of visionary um, things in that document that I think perfectly align with the city's overall vision in our own neighborhood that we have like a lot to benefit from. Mm -hmm. um, and as I'm reading through it, there's just like a lot of stuff that really hasn't been like it, it seems like it just needs funding action at that legislative level to get um, ordinances, you know, implemented in on our area to kind of like kickstart uh, you know, incentivize people to bring their businesses over here to infill with like, not just mixed use developments, but like really good urban design, um, well designed, you know, that respects the, the historic architecture of our community, oh, yeah. um, community values, um, and you know, underrepresented cultures, it's, it's a big ask 
but like what out of the, out of that plan would you prioritize in Glendale? Um, a lot of it. Uh, the of course, it was a good plan. I worked hard on that plan. Um, this was the second version. Um, the first one had to be frankly torn out because the community engagement part of it um, was not accomplished well. Um, so we started over and redid it completely. And I am very proud of that. Um, the biggest part of that is going to be the uh, business nodes, I think, that we have seen parts of with the lane reconstruction along 900 West to see the enhanced crosswalks, the bulb outs that occurred at 800 South, 900 South, and these types of things along Indiana. Um, and these need to be carried out um, on down to, I know Turner has worked a lot on the redevelopment of the California and Ninth West intersection um, to be able to make that safer and uh, more of a active node that is safe for everyone to use. Um, so with that, um, there are a ton of economic developments and housing options between, we now have funding opportunities available to us that have never been available for with the newly created CRA, Community Reinvestment Area, um, the Nine Line CRA. This allows us to bring tax increment financing to bear to leverage, to do all sorts of things, either buying property or uh, providing loans to businesses and to developers to build up the types of developments that we want and need in our community. Um, a lot of questions were asked regarding the five-year plan for Glendale. This would allow for, to incentivize um, both through zoning, through loans, and through actual development money to the business owners to have thriving grocery stores, not just one where Smith's is now, but multiples. I mean, the fact that we're stand to potentially lose the Tejadas market in Glendale is very disappointing, although it is a private business choice on their part. But um, that this means, though, that we have to be able to provide enough incentives and um, financing available so that more people can have that opportunity to create those businesses. Along with the, sure, we need multi-use where we have ground floor retail, but we also be, have to be able to provide programs to assist our local residents to create these small businesses that can, that add, only add to our, to the flavor of our community. Um, because it's not just about bringing in national chains, we've got to definitely support the wonderful diversity that we have here in District 2. Um, all of this can only be done and maintained if we have and support um, affordable housing throughout the community. And that's in every possible way, whether it's maintaining our existing naturally occurring affordable housing, creating duplexes, triplexes, eightplexes, um, but also apartments, also ADUs, accessory dwelling units, and tiny homes. We need to have all of these options to diversify our housing stock to give us not just enough units, but enough units that people can actually afford so that future generations, so that my son, I have a 17 year old and the concept of him actually being able to afford a place right now is absolutely far-fetched. Um, you know, it's not gonna be that long before he'll wanna move out of the house and we have to have options. So we have a lot more funding available to us through the CRA. Of course, the ARPA, the American Rescue Plan Act. There we have, in the city, up to $85 million available to us. Um, the county, what is that, $250 million, $1.2 billion at the state level. Um, the state has proposed so far in the next budget that they set aside $200 million for affordable housing. This is something that we absolutely have to push for. So do please, everyone, reach out to your state legislators and all the other legislators as well. I'm sure that they are in favor of this so that we can make sure that we've got um, enough funding to be able to provide affordable housing of all types. Um, let's see, the Jensen family comments that apartments are the worst. Single family dwellings bring so much more stability. It does, absolutely. Um, but single family housing is not necessarily for everyone. Um, there are other options, and that's why we have to diversify our housing stock. We need everything. Um, more single family houses, but perhaps on smaller lots um, so that we can still be able to get enough people in to increase our tax base just enough to be able to provide for enough funding for the amenities that we want and deserve. 
Um, let's see. I do this recall... one more question. Sure. If you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, what's please. your position on the Raging Water site? And, and what significance do you think that it has for the community of done right um, and done well? <laughs> immense, absolutely immense significance. Because I still uh, haven't, I haven't heard, um, like there's no project website as far as I'm concerned. Um, the consultant that got hired promised heavy community involvement. Um, um, Paulo, if you want him to answer, he's got to go. All right, we're, do we're it. down to the wire. <laughs> okay. Um, it is absolutely immensely important. Um, the public engagement process has not started yet. It will start uh, with a slow roll in November and go into the new year. Um, it is, Janessa had mentioned earlier, had asked about whether or not it would be a, some sort of shelter, some sort of homeless services. It will not. It absolutely will not. It was um, bought by the city under the agreement that it would remain public space and a park for time and all. <laughs> For time and all eternity, um, so it absolutely needs to be needs to remain a regional park, and that there is no plan for it yet. And I think that's fantastic because that plan needs to be developed by us within the community. And so that's where the public engagement process over the next six months is going to come to be able to determine what it is we want to see, what we need in our neighborhoods. Um, and then along with that, though, the most phenomenal thing about it is that we already have money to start. $3.2 million in impact fees were already determined by myself and the rest of the city council in the last budget in June. And in addition to that, there's another $10 million proposed in the upcoming bond um, specifically to go to that space to start to build. Now, that's $13.2 million that that's just a beginning. We could easily spend 20 to 25 million, depending on what it is we determine that we deserve. Um, there is another 440,000 for the boat ramp space just to the, on the river side of that. And Turner's cut me off here. So thank you very much all. I appreciate it. Thank you very much, Dennis. Uh, with that, we're gonna move on to our final candidate, Daniel. All right. Man, if you're still on, good job, man. We've had a lot of uh, a lot of great candidates, a lot of great time spent here. Um, by way of introduction, you know, you know, they like to say save the best for last, but uh, you know, in this case, both here and on the ballot, I'm the last one, <laughs> the last option on the list. So um, I'm glad I was able to squeeze in with you guys, and I'm also glad that I was on early, so we can come a little bit early. I think I we'd initially planned on my portion starting, you know, at nine, which is good. We can get done a little bit earlier. I'm, I'm already, I'm sure we're all tired of sitting here, but I appreciate you guys sticking out uh, this long. So I'm originally from Los Angeles, California. I've lived here in the West side area since 2011. So for the past 10 years, I actually used to live for a little bit when we first moved in next to uh, Riley elementary, where my dad lived there on ninth West. And then uh, I currently live in Poplar Grove right next to the Poplar Grove park. Um, I hold uh, my bachelor's and master's degrees from UC Santa Barbara in music, and I hold a doctorate from the University of Utah also in music and vocal performance. So I'm not a political scientist or a politician. I'm basically just a guy who decided to run because the opportunity was there. Um, it doesn't take a huge investment to run, which is a big part about what I'm, uh, um, uh, which is a big part about uh, of why I'm, I'm running is, is basically the idea that we need to have more community involvement. I feel like, right. I mean, and I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here, right. Anyone that's on this call cares, right. You're, you're the people that show up to the meetings. You're the people that don't really need to hear my message, which is that we need more people doing more things. And, and I'm included in that mix of, of wanting to uh, step up and do something about it. Um, do I think there's problems on the West side? Yes. Do I think the West side's a great place to live? Yeah. Uh, we definitely have a lot of things working for us and we're moving in the right direction. But um, if, if people don't step up and do something about it, they won't continue to go that way. Um, like Alejandro, I, I, you know, I think it's important to ask the questions about what's working, what's not working. Um, like Nigel, I think there are huge changes that need to happen here on the West side. Um, like Billy, I really believe we can make some changes happen, but we have to do it together. Um, and like like Dennis, like we we all need to be squeaky wheels, right, to get to get change and and to get things uh, to happen for us. Um, my platform is pretty simple. It's basically that we need to do this together. I don't come in saying I have all the solutions. 
Um, I definitely don't. Um, that we definitely have candidates that have had a lot more experience in terms of community involvement. I come in with a fresh perspective, thinking outside the box, not trying to do things the way they've been done because, you know, sometimes uh, I don't know how it's been done. Um, but I believe that we can find the answers with experts that know what they're talking about. Now, those experts can be like researchers who have data and have done stuff, but it can also be, you know, the experts are, are us, are the people that live here and know what's best for our community. Um, and I think that's important for any of these things that we're trying to do, any of these changes we're trying to make is that um, no one should expect the city leadership to come in and and save us right and I, I definitely don't want this to be a message of us versus them right you know west side versus east even though we definitely feel like that the east side has all this stuff they're getting taken care of the west side gets neglected uh we get neglected we we don't vote because what's the point of voting if you're getting neglected and then when you don't vote you get neglected and that cycle continues and continues and so more than just voting for a council member right we need we need you know, people to care, right? A lot of those changes and the improvements that happen in other communities happen because community, community, uh, you know, councils like this, uh, you know, st step up and and then their their councilmen step up and 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 we get things done. So um, about uh, yeah, my my big pushes are, are community involvement, economic development here on the west side. Um, I've been working, I work with the Pacific Island Business Alliance, and I, uh, it, which is a, a nonprofit that works in the Pacific Island community building, uh, building that economic strength. And I think that's a big push on the west side. Um, and we'll, we'll probably get into that when we get into some of the questions that we're addressing there. Um, and then there's all the other things that 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 the city council is responsible for public safety is big, uh, you know, keeping all of our, you know, the utilities working as they should, or, you know, getting the streets and the parks and, and those things. Um, and I think it's important for people to know where to go for those solutions, right? Um, I get questions like, what are your views on gun control? And I'm like, that's not like city council, right? I mean, you, but but they don't know. They're asking, well, if I make more money, how are you going to affect my taxes? Well, again, that's like a federal thing, right? About knowing who to hold responsible for what is, is a big thing that I find that a lot of people don't understand. Um, but with our work together, I mean, that's, that's why I'm here. And that's, it's just basically refining the process. I know I would be a great advocate because, you know, I'm just the neighbor. I'm just the guy that comes in with a lot of common sense. And, um, it, you know, it just does my best to do what's best for my community there. Now, um, we can jump right into, a, I mean, I get the benefit of, of having all the questions asked at this point, And I'm sure there might be some new questions that might roll out. But I'll just start rolling through this. And then if anyone wants to interrupt, just like start talking over me and you can jump in. Um, first question that was asked was the other side uh, village. Mm, uh, so it's the first of all, it's only a partial solution, right? The, and we've, I mean, all the candidates know this as well, right? I mean, the other side village has a specific niche that it's addressing in terms of our homeless problem. Um, and it's, it's, a, it's a small slice of the pie. But as far as as this project goes, um, I've also been to the Other Side Academy, and I feel like this group of people that's running this would be able to do a lot of good with that. Um, I mean, ultimately, I support the concept. I, I even, I mean, I support this project, but I mean, like Dennis is saying, they have a ton of, of hurdles they have to cross before they get there. I mean, even if everyone's like, this is great, let's go for it. I mean, I, I mean, it's like, I don't know, it's like that kid that's like, I want to be an astronaut. You're like, great, I want to support you in that. But you know, you're getting a D in science, like, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there are things that are working against the project. Uh, but the concept that I, I mean, the, the principle that I have is like, what else are we going to do with a former dump? Right? I mean, we I haven't heard anyone say, well, I, you know, I don't think we should build this there, we should instead build this shopping mall, which I'd be like, well, my, maybe that might be a better solution. But at this point, we haven't had anything else offered for that location other than this at this point. And so the, 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 the project I, I support, I mean, I think the group that's doing it uh, from what I've seen at the Other Side Academy is great, um, but ultimately like it's, it's not gonna solve our homeless problem. It's providing housing and amenities in our community. It's turning what's empty dump land into something. I, I support as many opportunities we have in our neighborhood to do those types of things. Now, what about our neighborhood? Why here? I mean, 
I, I don't have those answers of, of where it's at, but it's definitely the process that they, they've pitched at least towards us has been, uh, it has been in incremental. It doesn't sound like they're planning on building 400 right off the bat. I mean, from what I had heard was that they're going to build a section at a time as they build it out. Um, the amenities that are going to be there is going to bring in, a, you know, stores and theaters and, and, and facilities, which I think that whole, uh, you know, Redwood Road corridor needs so much, so much development. I mean, it's just basically an industrial wasteland on our side of town. I mean, that's great. We got the pick apart right there, but I mean, you know, unless you have a junk car that you need some parts for, I mean, there's so much um, other things that, that could be done there. Um, Dennis gave, gave a great answer to the fire thing. <laughs> um, I think I've maybe addressed the reason why I'm running, which is, I think things need to happen in this neighborhood. And if, if, if I don't stand, I, I'm, I'm basically proof that anyone can, can run. Um, maybe not anyone should run, right? <laughs> but I mean, anyone that, that wants to have a say should get in there, should stand up and, and, and should talk about the things that are important to you. Um, not everyone, you know, will run, but just be involved, however that may be. Um, and you are examples of people that are here on a community council meeting, but, um, you know, if you can't come to the meetings, like I, I miss a lot of my Poplar Grove community council meetings, but I love getting the updates, the notes. I read about what's going on. Um, I read the updates from my, from my councilman, you know, it was Andrew. Now it's Dennis about what's going on in the town. I mean, trying to be a, a good neighbor and finding out what's going on. Um, and I felt like this was one of the ways I could do that. Um, and so that's why I decided to run. Um, as for Glendale, I, I don't have a specific vision, but it definitely needs to have I'm, I'm, I'm with everyone else. My big push is economic development. And I think that needs to happen, whether that's with mixed how mixed, uh, mixed use housing. Um, I mean, we have this problem and the city can do a certain amount of stuff. We can help with zoning, which I support rezoning to, to fill the needs of the, of the community. But I think having a lot of the feedback about what are actually needed, right? Because what is going to be pitched all the time apartments? Cause that's, that's where developers make the most money. Um, the neighbors that have single family homes are going to fight for a single family home. Uh, they, I mean, right. Real compromises are where everyone's like a little bit unhappy, but everyone's kind of okay with it. Um, and finding those balances is, is going to be important. But I think, you know, we're, you know, when we lose markets and we lose places, right. We've, we've all seen these problems of uh, the West side being a food desert. Um, Glendale has their one, one grocery store. That's, that's on the docket to be sold and, and to be converted, right? I live down the street from the Smiths. I mean, we got the Rancho. I mean, we don't have very many good options. Um, and I think incentives from the city for, um, for economic development is gonna be crucial to bring more businesses in. Um, yeah, I have no idea about the, the Smiths there on 9th and 8th. Uh, that was pitched at one point about what we want there. But I mean, definitely, I mean, a grocery store is important. I mean, having food, having more retail establishments, right? We don't have to go to the, you know, the other side of the freeway if we want to get to a Target or a Walmart, if I, if I need to buy a mop or, you know, or something like that, unless I'm getting the, the cheapest quality one from, you know, from the 7-Eleven, uh, which we do have plenty of 7-Elevens, right? I mean, we need something better than that um, on, our, on our side of town. Um, I think people that... Um, don't believe in it, right? How do we how do we appeal to people that that don't have faith about the change? Is by by getting a few little things done, right? A, a few stops that slow down traffic. You know, people start realizing, well, maybe we can actually do this. A few a few steps and and bringing in a, a business or two brings in more. And so, you know, the faith will come when the actions actually start happening. Um, the I'm I'm with. Uh, um, Nigel in, in supporting the, the public safety in terms of strengthening our police department. Um, I feel like we should keep a well-funded police department. And I think we should fund programs that take things off of the police's table that isn't police work, right? Instead of, uh, you know, just defunding them, which isn't really, I mean, we won't even get into that. But I think that the police should be well-funded. So we have proper police officers that are well-trained and know what what they should be doing and we're working towards that right they you know salt lake has raised the recently has has increased the um the amount of uh of pay for the salt lake uh police department which everyone else raised as well so it, you know it's about you know it's it's a good good movement um but i think that i we should fund other programs that help 
alleviate that problem. You know, a, a lot of homeless problems that that get police calls need social workers instead. Need um, uh, other types of mental help, uh, mental health uh, help. And so having those programs in place is something that the city can continue to try to build out. And that will help alleviate problems like the Jordan River Parkway in terms of having trash there, in terms of feeling unsafe and having those problems there. Um, and that West Side Master Plan, yeah, I mean, all of it's great is if we can actually get some of it done. I don't make any promises like, oh, well, yeah, we're going to get it all done, right? Because, you know, there's only so much that we can do. But the fight is where it is. And the, the east side of Salt Lake didn't get just great overnight, right? I mean, any part, any part of the, the, the town is, is a step-by-step -step process. Um, and I think that's really what this job is, is about um, trying to, uh, you know, deal with the fires as they come along and then try to stoke the fires that you need to, to burn to, to get change in, in place. So I'll take a breath and let a question fly if anyone had anything else that they had on their mind that they wanted to throw out there. We also haven't talked about the inland port. That was uh, that's that's an issue that has has come up with a lot of people. Um, I'm sure we're all concerned about that. Um, I think this has been a really tough question that a lot of people have brought up um, in different contexts. We haven't talked about it here, but um, I think it's messed up that the city has been cut out of the picture as much as we have, right? I mean, it's the state has come down and said, hey, we're gonna build this whole big thing in your backyard and we're gonna give you no say and you're not gonna get any money out of it and all that. Now, I know the city has done some steps to, um, to try to stop that, right? I mean, we, you know, th throwing out lawsuits and trying to hold things up, um, but that's also a concern that, I mean, I think that as, as much as we can as a city to try to get in there and here as the West Side is something that we need as many people to um, be involved in the process. Now, I, I, I support the concept to some extent. I mean, we've been, how many, how many of us have been reading the articles about, uh, you know, the 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 docks in in los angeles and san francisco just being backloaded and and having a way of, of of alleviating that and getting 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 things here into salt lake and then unloading them here i, th I think the concepts are great but um i think since we're the ones that bear the brunt of the uh, of the effects of the environmental effects uh without without you know having a say in the uh in the actual you know <laughs> The decision making process is really difficult. I'm, I'm sure all of my fellow candidates are, you know, have tons of opinions on that. But um, I think that's that's a that's a question that that isn't going to be answered here tonight. Um, but it is something that we need to have a, a councilman that's fighting for to try to make sure that I mean, and it's tough when you're one of seven, you know, to, to try to, to have your voice heard. But, you know, getting together with with the other people on our side of town and, and working together. Um, but more than just the count councilman, right? It's about getting the people in the areas involved, right? Our district, District 2, we have a population of, you know, 20, 27 some odd thousand people that live here, right? Um, the last time the last election that we had, uh, when, when, you know, Andrew and Moroni ran against each other, I think we had, what, 2,800 people vote. Um, and I'm sure you guys here on this call are, are part of those 2,800, but I mean, that's, uh, that's, I mean, I think Alejandro pointed that out. We have such a low voter turnout that that's just one place where, I mean, talk's great, but you know, we need to put your put your money where your mouth is. I have a question. Yes, please. Um, what would you say is uh, what you would say your method is to effectively create more community engagement and voter turnout? Great. So this is a, this is a tough, this is a tough place to find that balance. Right. So I think that, um, I mean, I've, I, so it, it's a, it's a tough balance. Uh, one of the things that I personally feel strongly about is that there's a lot of money in politics that shouldn't be spent in politics and kind of as a, kind of as a principle of that, I, uh, I've not asked for any money from anyone in district two, because I've kind of, I've kind of been telling people, Hey, you know, cause people are sometimes like, Hey, I want to co contribute to your campaign. And I say, well, you want to contribute to my campaign, you know, you know, buy a taco, right. I mean, go to the store and buy something. I mean, that's where our money needs to be. You know, the, 
the $50,000 that has been raised on the West side, you know, the, the whole city council in, in, in Salt Lake has, has raised $240,000 this year alone, just for campaigning. And I think that money could be spent differently, but um, so that's one of the reasons, I don't know if you haven't seen my signs, uh, it's because I didn't make any signs. Um, so how do, how do you get involvement? And I think one of the things that we need to do is just create these conversations with those that are around us and influence our, our circles of influence, right? You know, um, I, I think that whoever gets, uh, you know, in the spot, if, for example, if I got elected, I would want to have a lot more in opportunities for engagement besides community council and besides our city council meetings, having more events, having more times for people to get together and actually discuss the things that matter. Um, I think creating these places, I mean, like, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I didn't create any mailers. I, I didn't, uh, you know, do that as well because, yeah. So um, I don't have a straight answer because the other side of that is right. You don't put out mailers; people don't know who you are. But I mean, so I mean, just going out and meeting people is is the way that I've personally been been trying to do that. Um, just the the face to face. But I think that the role of whoever does get this is, uh, you know, this this job because right, there's five of us going for it. Only one's going to get it. But I think the role is going to be to find different ways of creating more community involvement outside of the normal way that we've been doing things, because obviously that's not been working. I mean, we get the same people at the same events. So what are other ways that we can create, I don't know, more parties, more things like that? Um, so, yeah, that's kind of a, a vague, specific answer in the mix. I only got about half a minute left um, if anyone has any other questions. Uh, by the way, the other guys' mailers, they've been great. They're good mailers they, they, for, for what it is. But that's the name of the game. That's just the game I've decided not to play. And it's, it's not to say that mailers are bad or signs are bad. But, I mean, I think the process needs to change across the country, not just here on the west side. Thank you uh, very much, Daniel. With Thanks, that, everyone. We're kind of at the end of time. Um, I just like before we end the meeting tonight, just like to remind folks, we'll be back with our regular agenda next month. So we'll have conversations about 1700 South, public safety, presentations from the city departments, uh, and then we'll talk about the proposed bylaws changes. But thank you all for coming out tonight. And I'm sure any of these candidates would be happy to chat with you. Um, I'll give you all a second if you want to put your contact information in the chat one more time and I'll make sure that I put that over on Facebook as well for folks that are watching. Thanks everybody. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thanks everybody. Get some tacos down. <laughs>